morning. And it was actually April the 8th, 1966. I can't say I remember the day. But to that week, Time Magazine came out with their cover issue. And it was the first time in their history that they didn't have a photo or a graphic. And actually all they had were three red words on a black background. And it was a question, is God dead? Well, there was a firestorm, 3,500 letters to the editor uh, followed. Uh, A small percentage were glad because they felt like they could come out more vocally to question God's existence. And uh, it it began or actually continued a conversation that continues to this day. And uh, I, I just speculate if they were to come out with a new cover this morning with just words and no graphic, I think it may have four words and a different question. I think the question may be, is the church dead? Because some are saying that it is, or it's on its way, or it's on life support. And uh, there are those who are hoping for an affirmative answer. They're ready for the church to get out of the way, take restraints off, so that anarchy or uh, moral relativism can really reign. Uh, Every time I hear that, I think of back in 1897, Mark Twain, you recognize the, the writer, uh, he was contacted by an English journalist who wrote for the New York Journal. Somehow he had heard that Mark Twain had passed. And so he just wrote to him. And he says, is it true that you're dead? And I'm not sure how awkward that would have been to write. But to Mark Twain's response was, the report of my death has been grossly exaggerated. And I would add the same about the church. Now, on the surface, yeah, there are many indicators that question the health of the church. In fact, this morning online, I saw where a Catholic priest actually came out and he he had an interesting statement. He said, it's not all bad that people are leaving the church. And his point was, because they really didn't believe anyway. And so I thought that was an interesting take and and pretty accurate, I believe. And if you look at statistics, 4,000 churches close annually. Uh, There are more churches closing than being started. Uh, 80 to 85 percent of churches are plateaued or declining. Uh, Back in 1999, Americans answered a survey. 70% said that they had membership in some form of a church. Uh, 2020, 47% claim that they have membership in some form of a church. Uh, In the pandemic, over 100,000 nonprofits, many of them Christian-oriented, closed uh, because of the challenges. And yet the church continues. Why? Why are we here to celebrate Two years, but not just two years, but to celebrate what God has done and by faith what God will do. Uh, History is littered with people. Nero, way back in the time of Paul. Domitian in the time of the Apostle John. You could fast forward Mao Zedong there in China. Stalin. And I could go on and on and on. Said we are going to stop the church. We're going to, in fact, uh, Khrushchev, I believe it was, boasted that we could take a picture of the last Christian uh, in his lifetime. And of course, we can visit his grave, and yet the church is alive and well in Russia and different parts of the world. Now, there are challenges. On average, 400 Christians are martyred annually, and that's just the ones we can count. 10,000 churches were attacked last year somewhere in the world. 5,000 Christians were abducted in Nigeria alone. So yeah, I'm not painting a rosy picture that all is well. But my hope is not in statistics, nor research, nor in the front page. My hope is in the God of the Bible. And uh, our Lord who said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So I want to celebrate today that we stand with the winner. That we are here on the side of God uh, here in Super Bowl season. No idea who will win that game, but I know who wins this one. And is the church will flourish. We continue our series, The Flourishing Kingdom. And it's a kingdom of purpose and power. And again, the church, so central to what we understand God's will, and in fact, God's kingdom today. And as you open the New Testament, the book of Acts repeatedly speaks about churches being planted, elders being named. You look at the epistles that are written to churches. And so you may think, well, the gospels, they must be filled with references to the church. And actually, they're not. The word church only appears three times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All three times are in Matthew's Gospel. Two of them are in chapter 18 when Jesus is speaking about uh, the one who is called in sin, how you go to him, then you take a friend. And then he says eventually you take it to the church. And church is used twice in that one verse. But I want to come to the very first time, and I believe the most important time, we find the word church on the lips of our Lord. And it's Matthew chapter 16. 
Uh, in fact, it's interesting, some of you may remember 30 months ago, as this place was a, a dream and a vision, uh, Roger, Pastor Roger gave me the opportunity to preach at Cross Point and at West University Baptist Church, simply to put out there the vision for City Rise, Missouri City. And this was the passage that was given to me way back then, Matthew chapter 16. Now, unbeknownst to me, this passage was assigned this week to all three of our campuses. And so I believe it is of the Lord. To look back at the charter of the church. Uh, the church in Missouri City, but the church universal as well. And before I actually read the passage, I want to ask those who are present today, who were members uh, at that time of West University Baptist Church or Cross Point Church to stand to your feet. Our, our launch team, and you're still with us. Stand to your feet. Wow. The faithfulness of God. Thank you so much. You stepped out, you left relationships. I mean, they're not gone, but Sunday by Sunday, many of you attended amazing Sunday school classes, community groups. You had fellowship, you sang in the choir. You had all those things that larger churches can offer. And yet you followed the Lord's voice to say, we're going to step out, we're going to trust God, and we're seeing fruit because of your faithfulness and His faithfulness through you and through others as well. We started with 20 adults, approximately five kids, and five youth. Again, let's focus, along with our other campuses this morning, on Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 13 through 18. The first gospel, the first book of the New Testament, the 16th chapter, a fairly short passage this morning, 13 through 18. Before we read... Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. The promise is just as sure today as when spoken so many years ago. About 10 years ago, Susie and I had the joy to be at Caesarea Philippi. You can see it up on the screen. It's about 40 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had just fed the 4,000, if you read previously in the text there. Seven loaves, uh, a few sardines. This is different than the feeding of the 5,000. We have two mass feedings, which actually probably numbered 15,000, 16,000, because they weren't counting the, the women or the children. And then he takes his apostles about 40 miles north to this place called Caesarea Philippi. It was in the jurisdiction of Philip, therefore Philippi. Uh, it was a pagan place, 14 pagan temples. There was emperor worship there. Uh, it was the, the shrine to the god Pan there in the mythological structure of that day. And it was there, this pagan setting, that Jesus said, I am going to build my church. I am going to found this new body. Now, the word he used in Greek is ekklesia, which means assembly. It was sometimes used of a synagogue or, or even a, a political gathering, ek, to call out, those called out to a meeting. But he's giving a different meaning. This is going to have a dynamic that is unlike any assembly that preceded it or has come since its institution. He will build his church. And in the context of that, he, he poses two questions I believe we need to hear again Today, one is general, one is specific. He says to his followers, who do people say that I am? How am I understood in the context of your world? And then he makes it very personal, which he always does. But you, who am I to you? Who do you say that I am? So I believe these are expectations, not only of the apostles, but I believe of the church today. And so I want us to, to see Jesus' point, I believe, is to know your world. Know those around you. Now, what we don't see is a shrug. When Jesus says, who do people say that I am? They don't look at each other and say, I don't know. I have no idea. No, they're all at the same time. I heard Jeremiah. Well, I heard John the Baptist. I heard a different prophet. I heard Isaiah. I heard this. And, and it means they were engaged in their world. They knew what their cousin thought about this miracle worker named Jesus. They knew what the crowds at the market thought about Jesus. And so my question to you is, do you know? Who is Jesus to your neighbor? 
And I ask myself that. And, and honestly, it's been very difficult to meet our neighbors. Uh, now three Christmases, we've taken banana bread to our neighbors, and we can't catch half of them. But we'll knock on the door three or four days. By the time we get there, it's pretty hard on the fourth day. But uh, we introduce ourselves. We say who we are. We're there to serve. We can help them. And, and they're cordial. Uh, I wouldn't say they're overly warm or friendly. And so I'm not saying that's an easy task, but it is our task to know our neighbors and to know where they stand with the Lord. Do you know? Do you know where your coworker stands with the Lord? Do you know who Jesus is to him or to her? Apparently, Jesus expects us to know that. Uh, 28 months ago, as we were planning the launch of this, we, we set aside a couple of days. We literally went door to door, about 200 homes. And we asked people different questions about church and about the Lord. And we began to understand who Jesus is to them. We're still trying to find out from many. Uh, I met recently a lady who uh, was more interested in keeping the Old Testament teaching and the Sabbath than to following Jesus as her Lord. And so we're still deciphering who is Jesus. Not that the gospel changes, but that we bring it in at a point of entrance into their lives and into their being. So let me just challenge you to get to know your neighbors. We have learned that 87% of the children at the schools down the road live under at the poverty line or below. Stafford Elementary School is the same. They're Title I schools, so we know there are physical needs. We know that many are being raised by grandparents. We know that many are struggling with food security. We know the reality. We're beginning to know the reality, who Jesus is to them. And the truth is, sometimes it's hard to ask the question of the gospel when someone hasn't fed been fed in a day or two. So it's not either or. We bring bread and we bring the bread of life at the same time. And I believe Jesus expects us to know who are our neighbors. We've met over a thousand people who've driven down this driveway to my left to, to put food in their trunk. We met over a thousand students who either go to uh, the, the Missouri City Middle School or Stafford Middle School. And they've come to either the Cougars Den or now the Spartan Spot. And we've given them something tangible in the name of Jesus. So yes, we are beginning to know who Jesus is to our community, but there's still much work to do. Who do others say that I am? Well, then he makes it personal, but you. Who do you say that I am? Again, he just fed 4,000, probably more like 15,000, 16,000. To them, he was a miracle worker. He was a, an amazing teacher. He was one who spoke with authority. He was a rabbi. He was a, a model. He was an example. He was all of those good things, but that was not enough of a description of who he is. And that's why Jesus says, okay, they think they're being complimentary to say, you're like John the Baptist, or you're like Jeremiah, and there was a compliment. It'd be like if someone told me, you're like Spurgeon or Wesley, that'd be great. And that, that would be all that I could aspire to. But our Lord was the Christ, the Son of the living God, and therefore he expected more. And that's why he asked the question, but to you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking for the 12, I believe, in verse 16, says, You are the Christ. That's a Greek word. Hebrew word is Messiah. You're the Messiah, which means anointed one. You're the promised one. You're the sent one. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Know Him. Again, notice what Jesus doesn't say. And this just actually struck me a few years ago. Jesus doesn't say to Peter, Finally, after three years of pouring into you and these other 11 thick-headed guys with parables, with lessons, with late-night fireside chats, with miracle after miracle, Peter, you finally get it. That's not what he says. Because even though Jesus had taught repeatedly, and he said, remember when John the Baptist sent his envoy to say, are you the one or should we expect another? He reads that out of Isaiah. He says, tell him that the, the sick are healed and the blind see. And this is the day of the Lord. He's saying that I fulfilled what Isaiah wrote. And yet they still didn't get it. So what does Jesus say to Peter? He doesn't say, finally, you come to this on your own. No, he says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Why is that important? Well, I'll tell you, in my ministry it was freeing. Because if Jesus, the greatest teacher ever, can't get through to 12 men with the reality of the gospel message without benefit of spiritual intervention, then I can't either. And neither can you. And there is freedom. Because all we can do is share truth. And it is God's place to bring conviction. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
What a beautiful picture of how the spoken word comes in contact with the divine power to bring truth to bear. And when truth bears on a heart, that gift is received. What we see is what we saw this morning. A follower step into the water and say, I'm proclaiming publicly that I've received that gift of salvation. That in fact, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Peter's insightful confession, unfortunately, is followed by a nearsighted demand. If I were to continue reading, Jesus goes on a few verses later to explain to them, now the Son of Man has got to go, and he's going to suffer, he's going to die, and he's going to be raised from the dead. And Peter says, not going to happen. Peter says, I beg to differ. That's not my plan for you. Uh, you're going to come in your kingdom, but it's not going to be like that. It's going to be like David, and we're going to bring the crowds together, all the ones you fed. We're going to give them swords, and we're going to overthrow, and we're going to have that kind of kingdom. And uh, Jesus doesn't mix words. Remember what he says? He says, get behind me, Satan. He says, the, the glory without the cross is not possible. And salvation without the cross and the empty tomb can't happen. To know him is to know him fully, to know the full story. Again, maybe you've never thought about this, but Judas heard every sermon that Jesus preached. He heard every lesson. He heard every parable. He watched him. He had those fireside chats. He asked questions. Jesus interacted. He was a witness for three years. And at the end, he still said, don't think so. I'm not going to accept Jesus on his terms. There is that supernatural conviction that must have happened then and it must happen now. As a church, as City Rise, there are things we can do and should do. And we should be the hardest working church. We should be up before others praying. We should go to sleep after others, making phone calls, making contacts, taking food, loving on orphans and widows, visiting people in the hospital, bringing hope to the hopeless. Yes, that's what we need to do, but we need to understand only God can change a heart a life, a family. Only God can heal, and we've seen Him do it. Only God can intervene into those situations that seem beyond hope. But it's hand in hand as we're obedient, and we're cleansed, and we're forgiven, and we're humble, and we're useful in His arms, that not only can we know Him, but others can know Him as well. Now, Peter's claim is becoming less popular because Jesus is the only Christ and the only begotten Son of the Father. In his own words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That same Peter would preach to say, there's no other name given under heaven by which man must be saved but the name of Jesus. And that exclusive claim of Jesus is going to be harder for our children and our grandchildren, if the Lord tarries, to continue to preach than it has been for our generation. I don't know if you saw the photo of the man in the Mall of America. I believe we'll have it on the screen. On the front of his shirt, it said, Jesus saves. And and that was a little bit unacceptable. But what he had on the back of his shirt was even worse. Because on the back it said, Jesus is the only way. And uh, the guards, the security guards asked him to remove his shirt before coming into the mall. And it made headlines. And and, um, the difficulty there at the end of the story that I read online was that he was actually able to go in. But even being stopped, because you have a shirt that says, Jesus is the only way. I believe it's indicative of what we're facing. Now again, I believe we need to be kind, we need to be courteous, we need to be loving, we don't need to be angry, uh, but we need to be bold. And uh, it's sometimes hard to put all those in the mix. Well, the church today is declining. I gave you statistics. And so again, I I don't want to gloss over that. And there are reasons. Uh, The mainline churches, if you understand that phrase, to be a contrast to evangelical churches, many times they're declining because of a liberal understanding of Scripture. Uh, I understand the logic, it's just not biblically sound. And the logic is, well, people are leaving the church uh, for different reasons, so let's make it easier for them to stay in the church. So we'll water down to say, uh, it doesn't matter what the Bible says, everybody you know, can make it to heaven on their own way, just love people, and, and, and they water down the gospel, what actually happens is when people realize, well, I don't even need to be there. I can get that from Oprah. I can get that from TV. I can get that on my own. And so that's why the liberal churches, because they, they've left sound doctrine. Now, uh, oftentimes, the conservative churches are losing people because we've lost relevance. We've lost connection with our community. 
That many times churches are turned inward and they, and they beat the pulpit and they say, we're right and our doctrine is good, but the, the sad truth is nobody's hearing it because it's just a gathering of the family. And those outside the family don't feel welcome because they don't dress the same way or, or use the same vocabulary or maybe they struggle with things differently than the family members. And that's why sometimes conservative churches are declining. And so we hold up both. We are gospel-centered. We've said that from day one, but we're community-focused. Whatever your hang-up is, whatever your addiction is, it may be different from mine, but you're welcome here. These doors are open because the church is here to serve Christ and to reach the world. And those will always be our priorities. And Jesus is the only way. That's not because we're exclusive. It's because He is exclusive. Let me just say this. If there's any other way to heaven but the cross, then the cross was unnecessary. And it was the cruelest thing our loving God could have done. Why did He make Jesus, although Jesus chose, go to the cross if there's some back door? If there's some plan B, if there's some other curtain, we can say, yeah, but I'm going to get in because I'm a good person. There is no other way. Know Him, our Lord says. Well, finally, I do want us to look at know His church. As I've said, ecclesia, assembly, but uh, this is a new version. Now, when, when Jesus was at Caesarea Philippi and He said, I will build my church, my conviction is the apostles are like, good. Yay! What does that mean? They had no framework. It wasn't like they could go back, oh, is this going to be like Moses' church that he did? Or is this going to be like David's? No, there was no precedent. And so by faith, they're like, okay. And of course, in Acts 1.8, he says that you're to wait and then you'll receive power and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. And we're going to see the birth of the church. So by faith, they continued in their walk with the Lord, 11 of them, being faithful, and they began to understand what it meant to be a church. Again, Peter wanted a church without a crucified, risen Lord, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, that that was going to be a prerequisite. And when we put the stake in the ground at 2106 Fifth Street two years ago, we did so on the promises of God. There's nothing in me that thinks those of you that stood a while ago looked at me and said, this guy knows what he's doing. Uh, don't Tell me either way. But I don't believe that's what the impetus was. I believe it was the understanding a holy God is going to elevate His name in a community where it's maybe been forgotten. And we want to be on the front line to do that. And so we have been going door to door. We have been uh, working with children on Thursday nights. We have been doing a myriad of events to see them come in and go down a water slide and to be a part of eating uh, hot dogs and hamburgers and, and loving on children and doing all that we do. And because of that, God has reached down in His grace and He has touched lives. If you've been baptized here the last two years, I want you to stand to your feet. Look at that. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Actually, those who've been baptized equal now the group that launched. And, uh, and I believe, again, the best is yet to come. God is working in our community. And Jesus said, I will build my church. And don't, don't miss what he says after that. In the gates of Hades, some will say, which means the grave or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Again, gates are defensive. Uh, Satan does not attack us with gates. You know, he's not roaming to and fro carrying gates to come at us. His gates are there to protect his territory. And what the promise is, is that the church on the move will invade and will take back the territory that the evil one, that the deceiver has been taking for far too long. That's why the church is here to win. It's not here to be a social club. It's not here to impress people. It's not here so people can clap and say, thank you all for doing good things, though I appreciate when others notice that. It is here to take back territory that rightly belongs to the Father because He's not getting glory that He alone deserves. And that's what happens when the church literally becomes the church. We have prayed over 500 houses within a mile or two of this place. And we pray for God to have His way in those houses. We've left tons of literature inviting people to different events We've tried to be God's hands and feet where we've seen Him heal people, 
Families come together. People get jobs, practical steps, where people in this place have been used to bless people around this place. Again, 85% of the churches may be declining, but our Lord's promises aren't. He is still sovereign, and I believe that the best days are yet to come. Recently, I had the joy to be in Kenya. Many of you know that. And I, I, I met Josephat. His picture is not Jehoshaphat, but Josephat, uh, a man who about 20 years ago heard the gospel from uh, a man in another village. They were in a town at that time. And he went back, and, and the, the Lord just gripped his heart. And he sought that man out later, many, many miles walking, to say, I, I can't get out of my head what you said. And, and he came to faith that day. Well, he went to, he lives on the side of a mountain, and he went to the side of the mountain, and, and it's hard for me to describe the acoustics. One day there was a guy, he had to be at least a quarter of a mile, if not further, and Josephat yelled to him, and he yelled back, and they had this conversation in this valley. And he would get out, and he would preach on the side of this mountain. And he said more days than not, people would come and beat him up because he would preach the gospel. There's not another believer in that valley. So he said he wisened up. He said, I started doing it at 7 p.m. because it was getting dark and they wouldn't walk in the dark. And so he could finish his sermon without being beaten. Well, fast forward 20 years, he's been instrumental in starting over 20 churches, not just in that valley, but the next valley and the next valley. And I was able to speak in one of those churches, just started in the last year and about 40 people gathered and they danced their Messiah dance and they were so joyful in the Lord. And to see God's church is winning, not just in Missouri City, but around the world. Five years ago, I met a man who had been to northern India. And you're going to see a, a photo or a picture that you may recognize. And uh, this was uh, a Muslim man in that northern state of India. And uh, my friend and his friend were there on a mission trip. They've been there five or six days. And they're literally walking to the taxi stand to take the taxi to the nearby city so they could fly back to the States. And as they were walking through this alley, they were startled. It was already dark when they heard this greeting in English. Uh, good evening. And they'd already decided wherever someone invites them into their home, they'll drop what they're doing and they'll go. And this voice in the darkness said, good evening. Are you Americans? And they said, yes. And he said, well, would you join me for tea? And uh, they looked at each other in the dark and said, of course. And so they go in and this is where they're invited in. It's an art studio. And this man goes in the other room and he begins to make tea. And they turn around and they see this painting, not what they expected, in the Muslim painter's house. And uh, the guy came out with tea and they said, uh, tell us about this one. And he said, oh, that's my favorite one. Do you like it? And uh, they said, yeah, we, we really do. Do you know who that is? And he said, no. Do you know who it is? He said, I just saw this picture in the back of a magazine. And they said, yes, we actually do. And they begin to open their Bible and they begin to tell him about the good shepherd and the one who leaves the 99 together, the one. And they shared the gospel. And this Muslim man right there and then prayed to receive Christ. And he got his phone. And he called his brother. He said, you've got to come to the studio right now. Because I met some people who know the shepherd. And you'll want to know him too. And they started a church in that studio. The church is God's body to win. And it will continue to make progress as it follows the mandates of the Lord. I want us to look for two minutes and celebrate what God has done in City Rise, Missouri City. As we have a clip.
God is faithful. And I close with the story that I closed with, actually, the last time I shared from this passage. love the story of a little boy. Unfortunately, he was orphaned there in the Napoleonic Wars. And somehow he attached to Napoleon's army. And they taught the little boy how to play the drums. And so we see a picture of what he may have looked like. And uh, he began to play the cadence every time they would attack, every time they would charge. And there was victory after victory. And after several months, one of the, the battles began to turn against them. And uh, according to history, Napoleon turned to the little boy and he said, uh, sound the retreat. And the boy was stricken. He said, sir, no one ever taught me how to sound the cadence for retreat. And supposedly Napoleon smiled. He said, well, in that, in that case, sound the charge. And so they played the charge, and actually the battle turned, and they won it. There are many today that would say it's time for the church to signal retreat. It's time for you just to close the doors, keep to yourself. If you want to be quiet, that's okay. But there's no place for you in our society. But I beg to differ. And uh, on the authority of none less than my Lord, who said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Father, I thank you. Lord, that you are faithful. Father, you do not bless us because we're faithful. But Father, we trust you. 